Welcome everyone to the last lecture of this course. We're going to continue our investigation of instrumental variables regression. Before we do so, let me remind you where we're at in this course overall. So, from the beginning, we care about only one thing, that is the causal impact of X on Y. Then we mentioned you may have some omitted variable bias such that there exists a variable that is correlated with x and the determinant of y. In the presence of such omitted variable bias, the conditional mean zero, that is expectation of, of ui given xi, would be violated and your beta OLS would not be consistent. In the case that we mentioned in last course, last class about the effect of uh, of uh, crop yields on the probability of civil war, you can think about a lot of reason. Uh, we also said that you could have that there is simultaneous causality, that is that civil war is actually decreasing crop yields. In all those instances you would fail to get beta OLS that are consistent. Then we introduce the idea of using an instrument variable. And to be a valid instrument, this instrument variable would need two things. The first thing this instrument needs is relevance. We need to find a variable that is strongly correlated with X in the example we mentioned, that would be rainfall. We hope that rainfall is going to be strongly correlated with crop yields. We know this to be true intuitively, but more broadly, every time you want to pick an instrument, you should first make sure that, in, that relevance is high. The second requirement is the so-called exclusion restriction. That is Z, should precisely not be an omitted variable bias. This is because you want Z to have an effect on Y only through X. So you really want Z to have an effect on X and then X has an effect on Y. And you really wanna make sure that Z is exogenous to Y. And so this is why you have this crossed arrow here. So this is where we at in this course. So in the previous class, we studied a method where we would make use of an instrument variable that we call the two-stage least squares. In the two-stage least square, you need an instrumental variable Z that is going to first be used as a right-hand side variable, as the independent variable in this first stage, re first stage regression. And so in the first stage, you're going to regress X on Z. Once you have this, you're going to use X hat, that is the variation in X due to Z and regress Y on X hat. That would be the second stage. So again, the two stage least square regression requires you to first regress X on Z, retrieve the parameters from this relationship, and then predict X, X hat, and regress Y on the predicted X hat. Note that we're, we're only looking at a case where we only have one X, one independent variable, but this could be extended to actually many regressors, but that's not going to be covered here. But you should know that you can extend the two-stage least square method to several axes, and so you will need several instruments. We said also that beta two-stage least squares is actually going to be a consistent estimator of beta one if two conditions are met, and I already talked about it. The first one is the relevance. You want the correlation between Z and X to be 
well, certainly different from zero and preferably large. We're going to see in a bit what we mean by large. Second requirement, exogeneity or exclusion restric restriction. You really don't want zi to be correlated with ui, which is another way of saying you don't want zi to have an effect on yi, except through its effect on xi. If these two conditions are met, then the beta hat two stage least squared will be close to the true beta one with probability approaching one as the simple size becomes arbitrar arbitrarily large, which is the definition of a consistent estimator. Note though that if the first requirement, the relevance condition, that is the correlation between Z and X is quite small, then we're going to talk about a weak instrument. And then the beta two stage D squared is not going to be reliable. So let's develop on why a weak instrument is not reliable. So if Z is weak, then although the beta hat two stage D squared will indeed become closer and closer to beta one as the sample becomes arbitrarily large, it is not going to be distributed around beta one. Uh, it, it is not going to be normally distributed around beta one, even when the sample size is quite large. So consistency tells the, the definition of consistency tells you, you want your beta hat to become closer and closer to the true beta one as sample size increases. What we're saying here is that if your instrument is weak, that is if the correlation between Z and X, the correlation between your instrument and the regressor is weak, then actually the speed at which uh, your beta to stage D square is going to uh, become closer and closer to beta one is going to be very slow. And so you would need a lot of data before you actually get there. And so in that case, uh, the beta two stage D square is going to be biased towards the OLS estimator beta one, even in large samples. So here how you should think about this. The two stage D squares really relies on information about X that is provided by the instrument. Remember that what the first stage is giving you is how much you explain of the variation in X by the variation in your instrument. Okay, the first stage is again, you regressing X on Z, then using these parameters to predict X hat. So if your model is predicting a large variation in X, it means you're providing a lot of information about the variation in X. And so in your second stage, when you regress Y on X hat, it means that you have large variations that are explained by your instrument, which is good. If X and Z have a very small correlation, then Z is going to provide very little information about X until the sample is going to become very, 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 very large. So that's how you should think about this. In the presence of a weak instrument, your beta two stage D squared is still going to be consistent, but the speed at which the convergence toward the true beta one uh, is going to occur is going to be very, very slow. And so if you have small samples and relatively small samples, then you may still have a biased estimator. And again, bias is going to mean not centered on the true beta one. So there's a rule of thumb to decide whether or not an instrument is weak. And so you don't have to rely on just intuitions. It's not a very precise rule of thumb, but at least it gives you an idea of whether you have a weak, a weak instrument or not. So what we're going to look at 
is the overall regression F statistic. You remember the F statistic from being the joint hypothesis that two or more parameters are jointly zero, or alternatively that at least one of them is different from zero. So you're going to look at the F statistic that Steta is giving you in the first stage. Again, that's when reg you regress X on Z. So the null hypothesis is going to be that none of the parameter, none of the slope coefficients uh, are, are statistically significant. The alternative uh, hypothesis is going to be that at least one of the slope coefficient is different from zero. Of course, in the example we've taken here of a simple regression model, we just have the one slope, okay? So what are we saying in our context where we only regressing Z on X and we don't have several other X? Well, we're just asking that what we call pi one in class in the previous class. So pi one was the parameter, the coefficient slope on Z. We're just asking for the square of the T statistic of pi hat to be greater than 10. That's the requirement that we're going to ask. Let me say that again. In the first stage, you will know whether you have a weak instrument or not by looking at the F statistic. The F statistic is the statistic given to you in Steta uh, at the top right corner of the Steta output. That's something you had to discuss in the midterm two. The F statistic is in principle telling you whether at least one of the regressor in the model is statistically significant as an impact different from zero. In our case, because we're only looking at a simple regression case of just Z on one X, what, really, what we are really looking at is the F statistic attached to only one coefficient slope. This coefficient slope has to be, the F statistic attached to this coefficient slope has to be bigger than 10. Remember from when we looked at F statistics that the F statistic of a single uh, slope is just the T statistic squared. That's not very important, but that's going to help you. Again, rule of thumb, you will have a weak instrument if your F statistic is smaller than 10. If your F statistic is larger than 10, then you do not have a weak instrument. So that's for the relevance. Once you want to know whether the instrument that you found, Z, is strongly correlated to X or not, you're going to look in the first stage at this F statistic. Then there's the other requirement, which is exogeneity or the exclusion restriction. Now, this one is a bit trickier because there's no rule of thumb about what, how are you going to define this. The goal, the assumption, is that the correlation between zi and ui is zero. Again, how you should think about this is Z, zi has an impact on yi only through its effect on x. If it has an impact on yi, on yi through something else, then the correlation between zi and ui is not going to be zero. But again, that's not something you can check. Uh, instead, what you're going to use is you're going to defend the credibility of the exogeneity of your instrument based on the, on the knowledge of the context of the study. That is, as a researcher, if you find if you find an instrument and it passes the first test, which is the relevance. So say you do not have a weak instrument. And so people believe that your instrument is strongly correlated with your independent variable of interest, the endogenous variable X. Say you have that, then you would have to defend that your instrument is plausibly exogenous to the variations in Y that is, that Z only has an impact on Y through X. 
So for the rest of this lecture, we're going to go over the examples we saw in all the classes, starting with the last class, to try to understand whether we should believe instruments that were used. But first, let's discuss how researchers come up with instruments in practice. So, if you think back on the war example and rainfall, the idea was quite simple. The relevance was quite simple. We knew by, you know, just thousands of years of people growing yields, we knew that rain is good for yields. So the relevance was quite easy. Then the exclusion restriction, here's the idea, and we're going to mention that a bit later, but it doesn't hurt to say it now. Rain is hopefully exogenous because nobody can act on rain. Okay, there's no way humans are going to make it rain more, especially locally. So you may think with global warming, there's more clouds in the sky, and so we're all selves humans are making rains more likely in the future. But in reality, locally, people cannot change whether it's going to rain or not. So the idea is rain seems to be a good instrument because first, it's strongly correlated with yields. On years where it's raining a lot, yields are good. On years where it's not raining enough, yields are bad. So the relevance is there. As for the exclusion restriction, again, this instrument seems plausible because there doesn't seem to be an impact of rain on, on, on civil war, at least on its face, because there's nothing you can do to change rain. So it seems plausibly exogenous. So one way by which researchers may try to come up with instruments is they may, they may think of instrument coming from economic theory. In economic theory, we have plenty of variables that we think, that we think are related together. And so by thinking about this, sometimes you can use these, these variables and try and hope that actually the exclusion restriction is respected. But the search for instrumental variables usually depends on careful consideration of the context studied. It means usually what you really do is you think carefully about the effect of X on Y. Then you start worrying about the plenty possible omitted variable bias, simultaneous causality, simple bias, and so on. And so to deal with that, usually you're going to try to think about things that are correlated with X first, and then hope that you find one that is plausibly exogenous to variation in Y, except through the variation in X that, it, that this instrument is going to provide. So again, the idea goes like this. Where can I find an exogenous source of variation of X? That's the point of people trying to do causal inferences, especially if they want to use instruments. So think back about our demand for bed nets example. That was the Bascaline Dupas paper. She wanted to know whether people are going to buy mosquito uh, bed nets. And the idea was she wanted to know whether people were sensible to prices. She needed exogenous variation in prices because otherwise you would be worried that in areas where price are low, the demand is quite low and in areas where demand where prices are high the demand is quite high this would be an omitted variable bias but what she did is she herself decided what the price was going to be okay so she actually randomly assigned prices to household which means that the zero mean condition expectation of ui given xi 
in her case, was exogenous. This means that she did not need an instrument variables in her regression. Again, if the variation in X is such that you know that it's exogenous, that expectation of UI given XI is actually respected, then you don't need to worry about finding an instrument variable that would give you exo exogenous variation in X. So in the Pascal and Dupin example, because she has this randomized control experiment, she does not need to worry about finding an instrument. She already has randomly assigned prices, and so the first assumption of OLS is satisfied. Now, let's think back about the Nathan Nunn study. So remember that the study that looked at historical slave exports and how it affected African countries' per capita GDP in present day. So what would be a possible omitted variable bias here? Well, the issue is it may be that African countries, which are the at the time were the poorest, okay, so the less developed countries at the time, at the time of slavery, have exported more slaves. So you should think of it as this is a very poor country at the time, and maybe it's much easier to capture slaves or maybe institutions are weaker and nobody cares about having half the population taken away. This kind of idea. So people that were less, less developed at the time would export more slaves. The thing is, maybe the reason why they were less developed at the time are still reasons why they are still underdeveloped today. If it's the case, then this would, be, this would mean there is an omitted variable bias. So if you were just to regress how the log of GDP today, GDP per capita today, relates to the log of the number of exports divided by area, like we did before, well, this would suffer from omitted variable bias. So none is going to actually use an instrument for slave export, and that's going to be the distance of each country to the nearest location of demand for slave labor. The idea is countries that are closer to where slaves were exported are more likely to have, to have uh, uh, shipped away slaves. And that's because, well, it's easier for people importing slaves to just take them in somewhere where it's close. So the idea would be, if it's the case, then the relevance condition would be satisfied. That is, if a country, if an African country that is closer to a country that imports slaves, is, uh, so if you're such country, then you would have a high correlation between you being close to an importing country and the number of slaves you exported. So the relevance condition of the correlation between the instrument and the regressor would be satisfied. But then, actually in this paper, it then takes a lot of time carefully arguing the exogeneity, the, the, that the exogeneity condition is credible. So again, say you trust the relevance condition Say you trust that it makes sense that countries that are closer to importing countries of slaves actually saw a, a larger share of slaves exported. Then you need to make sure that this instrument is not related to changes to, to things related to per, per capita GDP today. That is you being close to a country that import slaves at the time can only have an impact on your per capita GDP in present day through the impact that it has had on slave of export. But maybe we can think about reasons why the exogeneity would not be respected, why the exclusion restriction would not be respected. So maybe 
the fact that you're close to one of these slave importing countries means that today, say, you're more likely to trade with them normal goods, not people. In that case, that would bias your estimate. In that case, the exclusion restriction would not be satisfied. So again, the instrument is uh, how close you are from a country importing slaves. Now, as I said, the, the relevance condition seems to be satisfied. It is true that the African countries that were closer to, uh, to countries that imported slaves exported more slaves. This part is true. About the exclusion, the exogeneity condition, the exclusion co uh, condition, the exclusion restriction condition, the, that's not that obvious that this, that this is respected. And again, this is because, okay, think about it this way. Say you're an African country that shipped a lot of slaves to the US because at the time you were, you were one of these countries that were closer to the US. So at the time, you actually shipped more slaves. But say that how close you are to the US today means that you trade more with the US also. If it's the case, then the exclusion restriction is violated. If it's the case that today an African country is really close to the US and it means that they are, uh, they are trading more relative to other African countries that are farther away, then it means you, you, are, you have violated the exclusion restriction. This is because your instrument, how close you are to the US, is actually having an effect on GDP today through trade today and not African slave. If it's the case, you violated the exclusion restriction. This is actually a well-published paper, a famous one, uh, that, that were used and defended very carefully the exogeneity condition. But still, you would have reasons to believe that this instrument is actually violating the exclusion restriction. So just so you know, the effect that he found was negative and statistically significant. So say you trust now both the relevance and the exclusion restriction. Uh, what he found was actually that exporting slaves at the time had a negative impact on GDP. One way by which it defends what he found is by finding, is by finding mechanism through which this happened. And what he showed in his paper and in subsequent papers was that actually countries where they had more slaves exported, people that remained in these countries started to trust less each other. This is because of the way slaves were exported. Usually the way this would occur was that one village would raid another village in order to capture slaves and sell them to be shipped away. It means that in the countries where slavery was the largest, where these raids would occur more often, people today tend to still not trust each other. Well, trust is a very important component of economic development. So that's also why this paper is so well published. But so again, what he found using this two stage square estimate was the negative impact of the number of slaves you exported on today economic performance. Now let's think back about the Chinese import competition paper. So recall that this is the paper that we looked at when we thought about fixed effect models. We limited ourselves to the case of industries in Germany, but this paper is much broader. And here's the the causal impact, impact of interest that they're interested in. They want to know whether facing greater Chinese import competition meant that firm, firms in the West, in Western countries, tended to induce faster technical change. The idea is China is producing what you're producing, but is much cheaper than yourself. One way by which you can avoid 
direct Chinese competition is to change the way you're producing things in a way that makes you more productive or that means that you're producing something that is better quality than China and would and would allow you to charge larger price than Chinese competition. So that's a way by which you can defend yourself against Chinese competition as a firm from Western countries or having larger costs than China. Here, an omitted variable, possible omitted variables would be the types that affect both the pattern of trade and the incentives to innovate across industries. As we mentioned in the fixed effect model class, if it is the case that industries or firms that tend to need to innovate less are also firms that face greater Chinese competition, then we have an issue. That's because Chinese import competition is not exogenous to changes in innovation. Okay, so you wouldn't capture by regressing log of patent filed on a measure of Chinese import competition, you wouldn't truly get the causal impact of Chinese import competition. You would also get the impact of being in an industry where actually technical change is slowing down. That's something, again, we mentioned in the class on fixed effect regression. So here are the solutions they're going to find. First, they're going to restrict the, the, all the industries they are looking at by just looking at the apparel and textiles industry. And so what they're going to do then is use within product level changes in quotas on Chinese import as an instrument. Here are, so now that I mentioned an instrument, immediately you should think about two things, relevance and exogeneity. The relevance is really linked to, to what hap what's happening when you have quotas. If you change quotas, so that you're actually reducing quotas over time, then some industries are going to see larger, co larger quotas being taken down. And so some industries or some firms producing some apparel are going to see larger changes in Chinese import competition. Again, from the perspective of relevance, if quotas are changing, then some firms are going to face larger Chinese import competition because they used to be in a case where there would be, say, low quotas on Chinese import, and then quotas are now much larger. That is, Chinese are allowed to import much more products uh, and, and of course, the same products that what you're producing. So Chinese import competition may go up because of this. So that's the first part. Quotas are changing, and this is linked with changes in import competition from China. So the relevance is there. Just let, let, for now, from now on, just let's assume it's there. The correlation between changes in quotas and import Chinese competition is large. Now you need to argue about the exogeneity part. You need to argue that the exclusion restriction is respected. Here's what they say to claim that this was exogenous. It turns out that these quotas uh, were set in the 1980s. That is more than 20 years prior to China joining the WTO. The quotas were defined in a way that in all that plausibly is exogenous to changes in Chinese competition and possibly also exogenous to changes in pattern filing, okay, in the technical change part of the regression. So hopefully the idea is that quotas are correlated with Chinese import competition, but the effect that quotas have on changes in technical, uh, in technical way of producing things for firms 
is only through its impact on Chinese competition. If it's the case, then they have a relevant instrument. The example that we used about civil war and whether it's impacted by crop yields is actually one of a broader agenda where we try to understand the economic causes of civil wars. Uh, and the instrument rainfall has actually been used in quite a few studies. A famous one is one by Miguel Satyanath and Serganti. What they're going to do is they're going to look at the effect of economic growth on civil war in present-day Africa. They are going to use year-to-year -year changes in rainfall across countries and use it as an instrument for GDP growth. So the idea is in Africa today, a lot of the economic performance is coming from agriculture. And so rainfall is a plausible in instrument for changes in yields. And to the extent that changes in yields are themselves related to overall economic growth in these countries, this is going to be a relevant instrument. Of course, there's a question of the exclusion restriction. Well, now, because they're going to use panel data, as you know, because they're going to look at effect on using year to year. So they're going to observe the same country several times. So now you would have to think of a an omitted variable bias or the exclusion restriction being violated in a context that is changing over time. All right. So because they're using panel data, remember that they're going to be able to control for any omitted variable bias that is constant over time within a country. And so again, what they find is actually that in years where economic growth was relatively better, uh, it meant for these countries that the probability of war was much lowered. In other words, when economic conditions are bad, usually these African countries tended to be more likely at war or to see more likely silver civil conflict. But note how important it is to them that they have this instrument. Again, civil war is likely to have a negative impact on economic growth. Okay, so if you think back on the simultaneous causality bias, it may be that countries that are more often at war or in the civil war actually, actually also have lower economic performance. And so that's why it's so crucial to them that they can use this instrument of rainfall to get exogenous variation in economic growth. Once you have exogenous variation in economic growth, then the conditional mean zero expectation of UI given XI is respected. And so you can trust that the results are actually giving you the causal impact of economic uh, performance on the probability of civil war. Now, another of our well-known example in this course, schooling and wage. Again, Schooling and wage has been studied in many studies, and that includes using plenty of different instruments. One that is quite famous in the literature is one by Enquist and Kruger, and they are going to use as an instrument the quarter of birth of an individual. And so that's going to be an instrument because depending on the year, on the month within a year at which you're going to be born in, or in that case, the quarter of your birth, you're going to have more or less education depending on when the limit is for a student that can drop out. Here's the idea. 
if I am born at a given time in a year, then I'll have to be enrolled by law until I'm, say, 16. Now, this 16 may occur at different points in time within my school curriculum. So it may be that I'm 16 quite late in terms of the number of years of studies I have or a bit earlier. And so age, which supposedly is as good as random because parents may decide when you're going to, when they're going to give birth, but probably whether you're in March or April and so on is not, uh, is quite random. Again, about the relevance. The idea is dropouts who are born earlier in the year attend fewer years of school. And actually, we shouldn't say fewer years. They're really seeing fewer months of school, but that may already be enough. Okay, so if you're born earlier in the year, the rule how early you can drop out happens to be a bit later on in life than if you were born later in that year. But here's the issue with that study. It's actually weak instrument. So the relevance condition here is quite a problem. Actually, you don't see a lot of variation of the number of years or even month of studies that people have depending on whether they were born in January or April or September and so on. So the first condition, the relevance condition, is actually not respected here. So the F stat, looking at the F stat, it's below 10. Some other studies have used different type of instruments, such as the distance to the nearest college as an instrument for schooling. That's also a possible instrument probably one that doesn't suffer from weak instruments. But of course, distance to the nearest college. Say college are in nicer areas, more like richer areas. Well, then maybe the exclusion restriction is not going to be respected. This is because if you're more likely to go to college, if you're closer to it, well, maybe it's also created with the fact that you're living with parents that have higher social economic status. And then that's the omitted variable bias that we all know about. So, you know, with all instruments come always the question, first, is it relevant? In this paper, which is quite famous, instruments were quite weak. And conditional on your instrument not being weak, can you defend the exogeneity rule? Can you defend the exclusion restriction? And again, that's, not, that's never something you can prove. That's something you need to defend. Okay, last slide of this course. So in this course, our main focus has always been to look at the causal effect of a change in X on a change in Y. We started by discussing how randomized control experiment is the ideal setting. Why? Well, because of all the assumptions that we made about the, the OLS method, the first one, the, probably the most important one, was the expectation of UI given XI should be zero. That your regressor should not be correlated with the error term. That it should be as good as random, that it should be exogenous. In practice, we, it's really rare that you can do that, or if you can, then it's nice, and then in some instances you can get it even a Nobel Prize if you run that uh, in an efficient way. But in reality, you're usually going to do the following. You're going to first regress OLS regression for which the assumption of conditional mean independence is reasonable. That is, remember, in a multiple regression model in which you have several control variables, the, the 
assumption of conditional mean independence means expectation of ui given x1 is zero even if the expectation of ui given the other x's is not zero but you want that at least the conditional mean independence is true for your regressor of interest second you're going to use instrumental variable regressions for which the assumption of instrument exogeneity seems reasonable. Again, relevance is important for an instrument. That's how strongly correlated your instrument is with X. But relevance is not useful if you don't have exogeneity. You can never prove exogeneity. You can never prove that the exclusion restriction is satisfied but at least on its face, it should look reasonable. More broadly, a lot of researchers are going to rely on natural experiments to provide reasonable OLS specifications or instruments. Now that we're living in this world of COVID-19, I can guarantee you that a lot of papers are going to use this variation, say, Say you want to look at the effect of pollution. So say you observe people living in an area that is more polluted. Can you compare them to people living in areas that are less polluted? Probably not. Why? Because the omitted variable bias would be people that are poorer live in areas that are more polluted. It turns out that if you're poor and you want to look at the health impact of pollution, well, there are other, other reasons why poor people are not healthy that are not linked to pollution. So if you were just to look at the cross-section of people living in very polluted area versus people living in not polluted area, well, a lot of the estimate would capture the effect of being poor and not the effect of pollution. Now that we have COVID-19, there's something else happening that is Everybody comes to a stop, production starts to stop for reason completely exogenous to whether you're rich or not. And now we can observe a drastic change in pollution, so an exogenous variation in pollution that is due to COVID-19 and the restrictions that government had to take. And it's completely uncorrelated with your, uh, with your social status. This would enter the type of natural experiment. The extent to which you, you are going to see pollution going down, say you want to compare across countries, depend on the extent to which COVID-19 was spread in your country. That plausibly may be incorrelated with plenty of other things. We see that countries are touched by the virus in ways that seem to be quite incorrelated with say their their industrial level the, the the how high their gdp is so if you wanted to run an experiment of the effect of pollution across countries for instance that would seem to be a good natural experiment globally we're going to call natural experiment anything that looks like a randomized control experiment but it's not coming from a researcher actually changing prices, like in the Pascaline Dupas bed net example, that's actually a case in which the natural experiment is coming from a drastic change that is plausibly exogenous. If you have questions, please ask them on Brightspace and good luck to all.